The world is at war. Right this very minute, there are governments, institutions and companies, many in Australia, fighting for survival in battles against cyber criminals. The enemy is not only vicious, but also extremely clever. Stealth is one of their most potent weapons, which means many of us aren't even aware of the catastrophic damage they're inflicting. Three months ago, Nine, the media company that broadcasts 60 Minutes and publishes newspapers including the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, was attacked. It was an infiltration that put everyone who works here on the front line of an extraordinary fight. More about the frightening extent of a massive cyber attack by an international crime syndicate. This is an ugly war. Stolen by hackers. Being fought every second of every day. You don't need to bomb a city or fire a single bullet to bring it to its knees. You just hack the critical infrastructure and you can really disrupt people's lives. The FBI says a Russian criminal gang called Darkside... The enemy is both sophisticated and invisible. Ransomware attack on the world's largest meat processor. Adept at probing human weakness and exploiting technology for money and power. Targeting a critical piece of US oil infrastructure. You cannot make yourself absolutely impenetrable uh, unless you disconnect yourself from the internet. The reality is we're in the midst of a wave of cyber hacking that's wreaking havoc and costing billions. The number of companies and infrastructure hit by hackers is mind-blowing. And the fear is, much worse is to come. A cybersecurity incident that is large-scale, that affects the very ability for us to, to carry out society in Australia, is inevitable. How great is that threat right now? Every day it hasn't happened. Um, the, we, we're a day closer to it happening. We might not know it, but we're all under constant attack. Nuisance calls and malicious emails designed to steal our personal information. But it's companies that are seen as the greatest money spinner for the committed cyber criminal. When did you first learn that we were under attack? Uh, about 2.30 in the morning when I was called up. A lot of the broadcast systems are now inoperable because the drawbridges are being pulled up and things can no longer work as you think they can. For you personally, what was it like to get that phone call? It's just a knot in your stomach that won't go away. It was, um, yeah, it was, t it was terrible. On Sunday, the 28th of March, Channel 9's broadcast operations chief, Jeff Spark, was one of the first to learn Nine was being hacked. Chin up, we'll be all right. It's going to be a tough weekend. Uh, this manual stuff a sophisticated hard. cyber attack had paralysed computer systems, knocking one of the country's biggest media companies off air. What does that mean for a broadcast company to get that sort of news? Well, you go back to basics. I mean, you don't want to, people to switch on and have nothing. So as long as there's something, um, that's a basic building block that we aspire to, and then you work backwards from there. In those early days of the attack... Yep, this these is These are doors it. I've never been through Just. before. Installation manager Mike Rath took me to a room in Nine's headquarters that very few people are allowed to see. This is it. We, we, uh, this we is the data centre, the very heartbeat of Nine's computer system, the very core of our communications. I'm not sure whether it's a port that was open or whether someone's come in with a USB stick and uh, infected the, the system. So once it gets into here, it gets in everywhere. So if you're going Mark to... spent 19 months overseeing the installation of this state-of-the-art computer network before it was infiltrated and poisoned by unknown attackers. It must be quite heartbreaking for you considering how hard you've worked on this system. It is. We, we spent a long time building this and uh, it's kind of like you're fighting a war. Yeah, you feel violated personally. It's, uh, yeah, it's like modern war warfare. But you don't even know who the enemy is? No, they're invisible. Uh, being in the technology space, we know that this is one of the threats we face, so... Um, but knowing but about it and experiencing it are two different things, Two different things. things. This is true, this is true. This is not something you would welcome upon anyone. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a massive disruption for the business, for the teams, for, for everyone involved. So 
um, uh, it does feel it does feel a little bit personal sometimes. Right from the start, it was Nine's Chief Information and Technology Officer, Damien Cronin, who had to contain the threat. Um, and allow us to intercept any adverse behaviour that we don't want going on. To isolate the cyber attacker, Damien and his team disconnected the corporate network from the internet and separated all internal networks from one another. Do we know where we need to It was a major disruption to services within Nine, akin to switching off the lights. Turning them back on would prove a long and arduous process, coordinated from the Nine war room. We know there are, is an adversary out there that, that we're fighting against, uh, and, but we're confident that we have the right team and tools in place to, to counter them. The very technology that brings you our news each night is right now under attack by hackers. The entire network was forced back to basics just to keep operating. For Mastheads, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, in the era of digital, they now had to rely on old-fashioned elbow grease. As the threat of the first day without a newspaper in 190 years loomed. Middle of the afternoon on Monday, um, our production editor said to me, I don't know that we can do this. From that point, I think my response involved some expletives, but I also said, no, we just have to do it. For Lisa Davies, the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, just getting the paper to print was an early victory in the face of the biggest cyber attack of a media company in Australia. But the challenge would be repeated over and over. We hear about uh, cyber attacks, we hear about this being the, the new threat of uh, modern warfare in a way, but to be confronted by mm. it, to see your workplace at risk because of it, what's that been like? It's really scary. I think that this is also an attack on democracy. I mean, this is we're a free press society and um, we hold the governments to account. That's what we do and we hold um, all kinds of organisations to account. So for this kind of attack to have occurred, yeah, puts us at the, at the front line of that, I suppose. Nameless, faceless, stateless, the people behind these cyber attacks can control or destroy computer systems with anonymity. Sometimes they're just lone attackers simply out to cause chaos or criminal gangs, locking up computer systems or stealing information to extort a ransom. They can be state actors out to steal national secrets or disrupt democracy. The truth is the reason behind cyber attacks, even who the attackers are, often remains a mystery. As it is playing out now in the cyber world, are the good guys or the bad guys winning? Well, there's no mission accomplished sign that anyone hangs up. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. The reality is this, the threat actors, whether they're nation states or criminals, are emboldened to go about their business. So there's more of them every day. Cyber security czar Alastair McGibbon is deeply concerned about the explosion of ransomware attacks that seek to extort money from businesses and institutions. Ransomware? is essentially uh, a malicious code that is dropped onto a computer that locks up that computer such that you can't access your files. And it can be devastating. Uh, and they'll then send you a message uh, to an email address that says something like, hey, you'll notice that you can't access your computer. Here's the, the address you need to send money to online. How many people pay up? Well, it's hard to know uh, in terms of small businesses, probably, probably quite a lot. Um, big businesses don't like talking about it. But sometimes all the attackers seek is sensitive information. One of the most advanced cyber attacks seen in the world was launched against the ANU, our national university in Canberra, where hackers stalked and stole the personal details of staff and students. It was on a Friday afternoon. I was literally about to get in the car to go home. Said, we've been hacked. So Andrew, we're in a fairly nondescript place. It's kind of hard to believe that this is uh, the most important part of Australia's cybersecurity. 
yeah, fairly ordinary looking buildings, but it's not the buildings that matter, it's the people inside them and it's the technology inside them. Cyber hacking seems to be the crime of the moment. Our intelligence and defence forces at the Cyber Security Centre fighting the wave of online invaders holding companies and individuals to ransom through the keyboard. This is very cutting edge. This is the tip of the spear. Assistant Defence Minister Andrew Hastie has allowed us unprecedented access into this cyber security fortress. We've got loan hackers, we've got very sophisticated organised criminal syndicates and we've also got very sophisticated state actors. So it's a broad spectrum and all those people present a, a, a serious threat to Australians. Considering how broad the threat is, this is a busy group of people, I'd imagine. It's 24-7. Last year, there were 60,000 reports of cyber attacks. That's one every 10 minutes. And they're the ones we know about. The real-life implications are costly and frightening, as ANU Vice-Chancellor and Nobel Laureate Brian Schmidt knows too well. It's a growing club in Australia to be a cyber attack victim. What is it like for you to be a member of that club now? It is very confronting, just like when someone breaks into your house and steals things from you. That's not a good feeling. In 2018, a team of cyber hackers stole the personal information of former students going back 20 years. It was, you know, like a Ocean's Eleven, if you want to think it, diamond heist. It was sophisticated. It was an attack unlike anything ever seen in the world before. A malicious phishing email designed to trick an unwitting staff member with one key difference. You didn't have to click on anything. When the little image previewed in the operating system, that was sufficient. From that single email, cyber hackers were able to steal a username and password and infiltrate the staff member's calendar, giving them a foothold in the system without anyone knowing they were there. When no one has seen it and reported it before, it is really hard to defend against an attack like that. That's almost anyone's vulnerable. We now know, once inside, a team of up to 15 hackers worked around the clock for six weeks, prowling through the system with impunity, covering their tracks as they went. An audacious crime that targeted the private details of some of the most powerful people in Australia and around the world. We train the future leaders, whether it be within the bureaucracy, the political sphere, within the technological sphere. And so the data of who and what we are to state actors is interesting, right? We train the people that they're going to care about when they're doing their espionage activities. But if we're talking about these people being targeted because of their future potential jobs yep. in positions of power and sensitive positions, I mean, that's a long-term game. Yes, governments play long-term games. They, they do. But also remember, our data set was back in time. So it provided a snapshot 20 years ago of our staff and our students. Some of those people are, of course, in positions now. There was no ransom demand. Brian says it was straight out theft, carried out by a nation state. Who is the state actor that you're referring to? I, I don't know. And if I did know, I would put that data out there to shame the, the state actor. People think they know. Yeah, people say but, China. Yeah, so they do, but be very careful in this game because that may be right, but it may be wrong. But often the attacks come from closer to home. Can you explain to our viewers how you hack? What do you do? <laughs> um, I didn't realise I'd be giving a masterclass on hacking at, on 60 Minutes, well. but I'll, uh, I'll try to. Um, <laughs> look, there, uh, Meet Matthew Flannery, a convicted former computer evolved. hacker um, turned cyber security about, consultant. Um, you can't find a hole in something if you don't know where to poke, I guess is a, a simple um, analogy. And the next step, how close to the centre um, you know, of the citadel can you get? The methods used to break into the computer citadel can vary from the simple to the extraordinary. You might call up and pretend to be, you know, Bob from network engineering and claim that you've lost access to a system and trick Susan on the phone into giving you that access. Uh, you might send a specially crafted email where 
someone unfortunately ends up clicking on something that they shouldn't. Um, you might launch a, a drone to fly up next to a building and you know gain access to an insecure Wi-Fi access point that somebody didn't bother securing because they thought, well, it's on the 52nd floor. Really? That happens? Yeah, sure. <laughs> wow. Once they're there, they've pretty much got the keys to the kingdom and they can move around in the system. As much as it might look and sound like a video game, for former police officer and now leading cyber security expert Alastair McGibbon, crimes committed in the cyber world have the dire potential to affect that's, us all. That's, that's extortion, right? Yep. As we rely more and more upon computers, uh, as we stitch more of our lives and our economy and our society into technology, then when that technology fails because of a threat actor, whether it's a nation state or a criminal, then it will have catastrophic consequences for us. People will die, there's no doubt. Economies will tip. And in the most extreme, society would be, you know, pretty catastrophically affected. It's a fear echoed by Assistant Defence Minister Andrew Hastie. I'm really concerned about our critical infrastructure. As we've seen across the world, whether it's the Ukraine having their power cut off in the middle of winter, or just recently in the United States, a water treatment plant in Florida and um, hackers trying to, to poison the water, or the Colonial Pipeline, which provides 45% of fuel to the east coast of America being hacked. Critical infrastructure is incredibly vulnerable. And here's the thing, Tara, you don't need to bomb a city or fire a single bullet to bring it to its knees. You just hack the critical infrastructure and you can really disrupt people's lives. What I'm worried about is a potential cyber Pearl Harbour. It's that big. Absolutely. Matthew Flannery has a deeply disturbing inside view of those cyber criminals at work. He was just 13 when he first fell to the temptation and challenge of hacking. I started learning about how to infect machines with, with viruses and what types of cyber attacks you could launch against other businesses and you know, that type of thing, and that's kind of how I, I got into things initially. These days, hackers don't even need to write malicious software themselves. All the tools they need are available to buy on the dark web. And how dark is the dark web? Look, some of the stuff you'll find if you dig hard enough on the internet is terrifying. There's people who are interested in, in pedophilia. There are, you know, people obsessed with murder, um, you know, people who are just blatantly evil. And, you know, l large parts of, of the dark web are, are dedicated towards, you know, hacking forums where you can register on a website similar to eBay, you know, and, and buy viruses and tools that you can use to hack websites, even if you don't have skills as a computer hacker now. That's really scary because it opens up a new door now for, um, criminals who were not technically minded. But in 2013, Matthew was the cyber criminal, convicted on five charges of hacking and sentenced to 15 months home detention. He was found guilty of defacing a local council website, but was initially accused of much more and faced 22 years in jail. A number of guys wearing um, you know, dark blue coats that had the letters AFP on them started flooding in like a phalanx of stormtroopers. And uh, yeah, I was, I was cuffed. I was led away from my computer. But did you feel cocky in that moment or Definitely were you not. I was terrified. So your interest in hacking, your interest in infiltrating supposedly secure sites, has that gone now? Have you changed? 2013 was a very long time ago. I've, you know, worked tirelessly to demonstrate that, you know, I'm not only of good character, but my intentions are sound. I've worked at some pretty incredible places and I'm very, very lucky to have done that. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've been given a second chance and, you know, I, I'll do whatever I can to not mess that up. In reality, Matthew's arrest and conviction was a rare win for police. 
Most cyber criminals benefit from the cloak of anonymity and the reluctance of most companies to report cyber attacks. Part of the battle ahead is bringing transparency, um, un unmasking these cyber criminals. In the end, they're, they're human beings using technology. Uh, they're very intelligent people, obviously. Then we need to catch those people and, and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. But they are an intimidating adversary, flagrantly trying to bully their victims into silence. Within an hour of going public, you were attacked again. And oh, yeah. the day after, you were attacked again. Did you regret it at that moment? A beautiful setting, obviously one you want to protect. Absolutely, it's a great place to live and work. Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University the in Canberra, about? Professor Brian Schmidt, is getting used to being in the sights of cyber criminals intent on hacking into the university's computer network. So how often are you under attack? Oh, every day, every, every minute. I mean, there are literally millions a week of little things, often highly automated. Yeah. But then there are more sophisticated things that are probably daily and then very sophisticated attacks, probably state actor style attacks, once a month or so. So they're the people who know what they're doing. They're the people who really know what they're doing. After being hacked twice in 2018, the ANU is just one of a growing number of entities under attack. What makes it different is that Brian is willing to talk about it. Radical transparency is the way. You actually show people what you did, why you got broken into, and you stand by the facts and your analysis and decision making. That gives people the ability to trust you because they, there's nothing hidden, no games. Because within an hour of going public, you were attacked again. And oh, yeah. the day after, you were attacked again. Did you regret it at that moment? You know, when you, when you make yourself a name, there's you know, seven billion people on the planet Three of them have an internet connection, and some subset of them are going to try to knock your door down because it's fun. So we knew that was coming, but no, I, I absolutely had no, no regrets. Brian's confidence also stems from the increased investment in cybersecurity to keep the personal data of staff and students safe from hackers. And I'm trying to use this as a way to say, hey, you know, we didn't get it right. We took ownership of our issues, we're prepared to stand on what we're doing now and try to be best in sector. And I think we are now best in sector, but we're not impenetrable. It's now believed the attack on Nine was led by a criminal gang, not a state actor. But according to Nine's broadcast operations chief, Jeff Spark, whoever it was, was booted out empty-handed. Was this a ransomware attack and did Channel Nine pay any ransom. We didn't engage with anybody, so we got attacked. There is no element of you know, someone getting paid and then unlocking something. That, that didn't take place. We do have a considerable depth of experience and understanding of how to get around this. So that's what, that was exactly the way we attacked it. Nine's Chief Information and Technology Officer, Damien Cronin, says nearly three months on, Functionally, we're close to a full recovery. But staying secure is a long-term commitment. The work continues in some ways. We're, we're past the crisis, but the hard work begins around uh, us improving and resolving much of the underlying issues that, uh, that we want to get to to improve our security posture. Are you prepared to say what those underlying issues are? Uh, they're not unique. Uh, many large corporates have... Uh, lots of systems and, and, uh, and those systems over time are at various phases of their life cycle. Um, and because of our breadth as an organisation, um, it requires uh, just continual investment to ensure that they're up to scratch and meet the security expectations of the organisation. And in this day and age, with the threats as they are, I mean, that, you have to do that, don't you? I mean, that is, is beyond prudent. Correct. Uh, it's, it's not only prudent, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary activity. And Minister Andrew Hasty warns, we all need to take on the responsibility of protecting ourselves because we're all targets. I think most Australians think there is a cyber threat, but it doesn't relate to them and they're fine. 
But the reality is that we're all on the new battlefield, which is cyber. We've always thought about warfare in terms of land, sea, or air. But if you own one of these, you're on the battlefield and you're a potential target. So what do we do about it? Nobody's going to throw away their phone. No, that's right. But there are many things you can do which are very, very basic to protect yourself. The first thing you can do is upload the security updates when Apple or Android prompts you. You can use complex passphrases. You can back up your data into a cloud or onto a USB or a hard drive. And you can use multi-factor authentication, which is just two pieces of identification before you can access your email, for example, or, or a bank account. As confounding as the tech world can be, Brian Schmidt says a simple change in thinking could well keep the burglars out. Thinking about security in the same way we think about our homes and our cars, and we need in digital to be the same way. We need to sensibly manage risk and quite frankly not just leave the door open and say, come in here and steal all my stuff, which is unfortunately effectively what people are doing when they have no knowledge of, of cybersecurity. They're just opening the door and saying, come on in. And there are plenty of people willing to go through the door. Indeed they are. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9Now app.